for just a second. <laughs> Not a problem, sir. Okay, never mind. You... It was a text that sorry, it was a text that Jim was calling here shortly. In a moment. Jim Arvanita. Do... Now tell me what you know about Jim. Jim was one of these guys doing videos before we had things like uh, you know, popular Gracie Jiu Jitsu. He was one of the people that kind of put mixed martial arts together with the pancreation, uh, bringing back some of the Olympic styles and showing people how to defend themselves. Uh, you know, much like we just ended with talking with Dean, uh, Jim is still uh, at his age even uh, very fit and able uh, to instruct and, and put out all kinds of uh, videos on how to practically defend yourself in several situations. Um, what do you know of Jim as we wait for him to call in uh, on the Nutsack Foods hotlines? And uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about how, you know, he, he's a real predecessor to what we're all involved in. Well, I know he's like uh, basically the the representative of, of pancreation, which is the ancient uh, Greek uh, form of MMA that uh, was the first uh, that we know of, uh, you know, style of this fighting. And that's pretty much all I know about Jim Arvidas. Well, he's a, he's a former guest uh, of my show uh, when when it was You More Alive with me and Big Perm. And honestly, let's just get to know the man. I mean, I know that you're, as a lifelong martial artist yourself and mixed martial arts world champion, uh, pride and UFC veteran, going to have a very easy time talking to this man. We're welcoming in to the Every Victory Earn Studios on UMOL I right now, Jim Arvanitas. Welcome to the show. Uh, how are you doing tonight, sir? Very good. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? I'm doing outstanding. Again, I'm Dave the Butcher Clifford, and I'm going to introduce my co-host and let him start the interview. Uh, this is James Lee. Hello, James. Hey, how are you, Jim? Are you, are you prefer to be called today. Jim or James? Jim's fine with me. How about yourself? <laughs> James. <laughs> okay, cool. Hey, right, now, where you, would you like to start? Where would you like to start, uh, James? I'd like to let you get a chance because this is this is outstanding. I mean, he's uh, I mean, he's gone everywhere from working with people like Luthez, Bruno San Martino, Killer Kowalski, and then and there's Thai boxing, judo, kung fu. Uh, you know, tying everything together. One of those people that really studied several different martial arts to create, uh, you know, a, a form of not only competition but self-defense that does incorporate uh, the fact that the fights and confrontations can happen from several different positions. Absolutely. Yeah. Can, <laughs> could you hear me? Sure. Are you kind of changed for a second there? I got you. I'm, you're back. Damn it. Well, go on ahead. He, he's gone everywhere. You know, he's he's uh, worked out with everybody from, uh, you know, he's done Western wrestling and boxing at a very early age, working with people like Luthaz, Bruno Sammartino, Killer Kowalski, and then going into Thai boxing, catch wrestling, judo, karate, kung fu. And then by, the, by 1969, he had assimilated several different techniques and training into what you, you would call a real comprehensive system and started really learning about the roots of martial arts. And so, you know, especially of the Greek uh, ethnicity. So I'll give you that to start with, my brother, because I know you're going to really enjoy this man. And, again, Jim Arvanitas, thank you. And James Lee, go on ahead and take this wherever you'd like. Yeah, actually, Jim, I've, I've seen some of your um, books and things of that nature, and I, I saw you in some of the uh, old-school magazines that I used to look at, look at and check out grappling magazine, things of that nature. So... I've been aware of you for for quite some number of years. Um, it's a pleasure to interview you, man. I'm super excited. Um, thanks for coming on the show. Also, too, Jim, um, I always like to find out the, the beginning, the origin of, of you, and 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 what got you involved, and and how you became interested in this, and then how did you learn about the the pancreation, and and, and kind of went off to the old school and into the origins of of martial arts. Um, well, James. Um... We've got to go back about, uh, and I hate to date myself, but it's like uh, <laughs> 55 years ago. Um, I came from a, a very strong uh, Greek background. My father was from Sparta, which is the modern-day Sparta in Greece. And um, 
his whole concept with his sons uh, was that uh, the oldest son would be the protector of the family and uh, the youngest son, of course, would uh, follow the, the older brother. And um, we both had to be athletes. That was another priority. And, uh, you know, since I was protecting my brother and the family, I started, you know, in uh, old freestyle wrestling way back when I was about seven years old at a local YMCA. And my uh, younger brother um, took up golf and uh, today is a golf gym champion. So. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's won all kinds of of tournaments and set all kinds of records in the state of New Hampshire, and it, it receives honors all the time. In fact, both of us were were, were voted into the uh, Granite State Athletic Hall of Fame. And, um, you know, we were both um, um, also um, uh, made um, you know recognized as um, contributors to to sports and athletics in uh, New England. Um, so getting back to, to my, my early roots is, uh, you know, I started out with wrestling um, and, and proceeded to boxing, and, uh, but they wouldn't let me spar because I was too young, so basically I just cleaned the gym. And uh, At the time we were, we were training, uh, and I was more or less observing um, in low mass. My dad would, would drive me down to classes, and uh, we had a dingy, uh, very ill-lit gym, <laughs> but we had all the equipment we needed, holes in the heavy bags, a grungy old uh, boxing ring, and um, the Susi brothers uh, saw something in me and, and um you were very friendly with my dad, and, and they started kind of like, um, you know, teaching me the ropes and, and how to hit a speed bag and things like that. Now, Lowell at the time was the hub of boxing, um, and, you know, we used to have guys like Hagler come in, and uh, um, we had Roberto Duran come in, and we had right. uh, Alexis Arguello and all these top fighters. And, uh, I mean, coming into this gym was like... Uh, just an amazing thrill, you know, to see these guys. Uh, Aaron the Hawk Pryor came in, and he was really right. a character. But, but these guys had skills that were, you know, just, just incredible. And and at the time, I really, really wanted to get in there and work with the guys. And slowly but surely, you know, they taught me how to hit the heavy bag and the double end bag and the focus mitts and all of this. And I'd watch them smar- spar in the ring and and eventually, you know, when I got old enough, they, they gave me a shot. Now, I'll tell you a funny story. Roger Susi was the more verbose of the brothers. And um, they were like, you, you know, he was the kind of guy that you, you always had to, um, you know, kind of like, uh, he, he was a jovial guy, but he was always testing you. And he said it was almost like uh, in the Kung Fu series with Dev, David Carradine, if you could snatch, you know, the pebble out of the, the master's hand, he would, you know, take you to the next level of instruction or whatever that was. Well, with me, uh, Roger said, listen, if, if we'll do some slap boxing. And if you can hit me once or even come close, I'll, I'll throw on some gloves and you can get in there and work out with some of the younger, younger fighters. So I said, okay, well, of course, you know, I – get my face smacked around the first few times. But eventually, you know, I was about, oh, 14, 15, um, I smacked him in the mouth, and I bloodied his nose. And uh, he said, boy, you're quick. And he says, I think you're ready. I think he threw me in the, the ring just to see me get my ass kicked. But <laughs> it, it really was a great learning experience because I was a fast learner. I had observed all those years. And... Um, you know, it taught me a lot, and I, I ended up competing with the guys and eventually um, getting into the, the New England Golden Gloves. So th- that was a, a thrilling experience for me. And um, How did you do in um, Golden know, Gloves? Again, how did I do? Yeah. I did great. I did great. I didn't win. Did you win? No. Well, no. I won my first two bouts. And then my third bout, and you probably heard this story. I'm not sure if you did. You know, at the time, um, 
the, it was very, very difficult, you know, the, to to uh, match fighters uh, in the New England area. So a lot of times, you know, you, you'd be up against the guy that was your own weight, but he was like three t- three heads taller than you were, you know. And here I was about five seven, five eight, and I'm fighting a guy like six foot one. It was a very frustrating match, and you know, I ended up, you know, doing some moves that. Because I couldn't reach his body, I was hitting him in the groin a lot, so I got disqualified. But anyways, it was fun, and it was a great experience. But again, it wasn't enough, because at the same time, I was getting into a lot of street fights, hanging around Boston a lot. And, um, you know, the combination of boxing and wrestling were great, but I had to learn more about going to the ground. Back then, you know, a lot of the fights, you know, even today... Uh, If you're in a street fight, those people that believe that it's going to remain standing all the time, I think, you know, are a little foolish. Um, Because as you well know, fights go to the ground. So you have to be ready for the ground. And I didn't think my wrestling was strong enough. I mean, I knew how to get top controlled. I had great spin moves. Um, But the fact is, what happened if you were on the bottom? You know, a lot of times, you know, if you, you caught top control of the dominant position, this was great, you know, because you could take the guy down, do a leg takedown, waist takedown, whatever, mount the guy, get on top of him, you know, cross pin him, whatever you wanted to do, and you could land shots to his face. You know, the old schoolboy dirty fighting, if you will. But um, Ground and pound. Near ground and pound. Well, yeah, exactly. But, you know, <laughs> I, I got in a fight with a guy that outweighed me by about 80 pounds, and he was a damn good collegiate wrestler. And here I was still in high school, and this guy pinned me on the ground, and I'm saying, well, what do I do next? And, you know, you don't have much of a chance to think when you're pinned by a guy that outweighs you by that much. So, man, you know, being a Spartan blood, I didn't want to lose the fight, so I had to resort to what we'd call some, some dirty tactics to get the guy off of me. But I definitely learned a lot from that fight because – I realized, well, I've got to learn how to fight on the ground better. So I started learning catch wrestling. And this is where I met these WWF fighters, the old um, World Wrestling Federation guys. And uh, they would come and into NWA, my father. Yeah, it's, that's it. They would come into the uh, McMahon had, had, had taken over from his dad, and they would come over to my father's restaurant because my father was in the restaurant business. And they would wrestle next to my father's restaurant in this place called a Palace Theater. And they would have breakfast and dinner. They loved my father. My father was a very uh, gregarious guy, and they would come in, and he'd feed them right. Well, of course, my mind just went berserk when I saw these guys come in because I was a big wrestling fan, and I wanted to I learn that, what they knew. Uh, the fact I hope was that one of them liked you know, Saganaki. At least, I love that me? stuff, man. That's my. I love Saganaki. Speaking of a Greek restaurant, I can't let you talk further without oh, mentioning oh, Saganaki. Oh, absolutely, Saganaki, sure, sure. My that cheese favorite. is great, especially when they light it on fire, right? Oh, it's beautiful. Opa, 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 <laughs> my brother. Stuff. Yeah, it is. Yes, it sir. Is. Please continue, man, because I love uh, old school. Me and James are big time old school fans of AWA, NWA, the early WWF. You know, yeah, uh, World Class Champion stuff. Now, yep. now, I hope though, with the way we're talking, you're not considering me old. I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Oh. <laughs> I'm pretty anyway, old, though. Yeah, it's legend. Legend, <laughs> sir. Thank you, sir. Anyway, we. Uh, they, uh, Haystacks Calhoun would come in, and uh, Bruno <laughs> Sammartino, um, Superfly, Jimmy Snuka, all these guys were coming in. But the guys that I really admired was Walter uh, Killer Kowalski, Lou Fez, uh, Vern Gagne, and um, these guys would, would actually tell me to come on over. And, uh, you know, they'd show me some catch wrestling, catch as catch can. And I thought I was going to go in there and learn these, you know, these uh, hitting each other with a chair and, you know, the stuff you see in the ring that's for entertainment. And they really opened my eyes because they really knew how to apply submissions on the ground. 
Now, I had studied freestyle wrestling and even Greco-Roman before that. And basically, it was primarily throwing techniques and positioning, uh, you know, scoring points and, and pinning a guy. But uh, this was amazing. You know, the neck cranks and the chicken wings and all of these other moves. You know, you may see a smidgen of it in some of the matches on TV, but, uh, you know, most of <laughs> it was all this. That's right. Not yeah. since Flair. Not more is right. Not since Flair. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, good old Ric Flair. But, you know, Ooh. you know the clotheslines, all of this stuff that you're seeing today, you know, the, that's not what they showed me. They were showing me moves where you took a guy down, and it was some pretty skillful stuff submission-wise on the ground. So, you know, that really kind of opened my eyes. And so I worked with them every time they were in town, and, um, you know, it, it just kind of like broadened my my striking slash grappling amalgam, if you will, because I didn't know what I liked better. I didn't know whether I liked the striking game or boxing or if I liked going to the ground and grappling. And um, I just couldn't conclude. Now, you know, in competition back then, there was no combination, you know, like there is in MMA today. You either boxed or you wrestled. So in the back of my mind, I started thinking, well, there's got to be a way to combine the two and make some kind of a competitive sport out of it. And I mean, you know, okay, you'd see some of the wrestlers throwing their slaps and and things that you saw later on in Penn Grace. But, you know, I really wanted to combine the, the, the sweet science along with the wrestling. So around, oh, I don't know when it was, um... It must have been like 66, 67. Uh, I had a oh. fight with a Marine, and he was a black belt in uh, Taekwondo. And he landed a kick, and it hurt. Um, I was able to take <laughs> him down, which showed me the superiority of the ground game and, and the takedown, because he, he didn't know what to do when he got to the ground. But standing up, these kicks were pretty dynamic. I wanted to learn how to kick like that. So I started looking for different, you know, styles of kicking, and that brought me to Savat, Box Francais Savat. Whoa. Yeah, Sweet. yeah. So, you know, precision kicking with a toe and, and uh, you know, the hand techniques, I already knew that stuff from boxing, but the kicks were really, you know, dynamic and impressive. So I studied that in Boston for a while, actually went to Canada, uh, for weekends, and I learned, you know, from some of these, these top guys that were uh, training in Savat. And, you know, it was a, to me it was a good sport, a good fighting art, because it was reality. It was like boxing and wrestling because of the hands-on. Uh, now, I had already known about karate, you know. Um, um, we had all seen Bruce Lee as Kato and the Green Hornet. Uh, but, but when I started really looking into karate for kicking, I saw all the forms they were doing, and I got to tell you, it was a turnoff for me, because I had come from a, a sports background that, that really emphasized, you know, getting in there and adapting to your opponent and, and uh, sparring. So, you know, after Sabat, um, I became friendly with an exchange student at college by the name of Super Chai Patanai, Super Cat for short, and uh, he was a uh, bantamweight champion from his uh, homeland there in Thailand. So we started working out together, um, and really became great friends. And he was I was showing him about elbows and, and knees. This was when elbows and elbows. knees. I'm waiting on oh, I'm waiting on that it. part. Elbows and knees. Yeah, you bet. Weapons, baby. Yep, yep, eight weapons, and then some. And when you got in that neck clinch, I'll tell you, great stuff. And this guy weighed about 120 pounds, and he could kick like hell, and he was fast as lightning. So I said, i got to learn this stuff. And he said, well, you teach me how to wrestling, you teach me how to box better, and I'll teach you this, this what I know, you know, Muay Thai. And um, so, and Muay Baran. He was skilled in that as well, the old school Muay Thai. So we uh, don't mind James's dog. Hey James, 
Sorry, buddy. Hey, James, are you going to be able to postpone your phone call? Because we got a half hour left after 11, and this is riveting. I know that uh, we're getting to some stuff you're going to love, it, just in case you can. Is it a business call? Yeah, I got I to gotta talk with the owner of my lab. Um, I told him on the radio. Uh, I don't know. It's going to be tough. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do. All right. Well, first of all, I wanted to get a couple of things in before you go. Um, at which time was it? Because, you know, one of the things that anybody that listens to our show that is training uh, to become mixed martial artists, which is primarily our audience, but we have a lot of listeners who enjoy traditional martial arts and are really only active in things like that, you know, for self-defense reasons and to learn an art and stay in shape. Now, athletically, you have to be at tip-top performance, especially when you're working this many different techniques. Uh, any mixed martial artist will tell you, hey, if I got a Muay Thai class, a catch wrestling class, a jiu-jitsu class, a boxing class, a kickboxing class, possibly throw in some Wing Chun if you know somebody uh, to throw some extra shit in there that somebody might never see. Some people go to Capoeira. I mean, there's millions of ways to put an arsenal together. And this is... Uh, what you were doing back uh, back before there were even riots in Detroit. I mean, back when uh, you know LBJ was in office and stuff, you were we were starting to come up with the idea for uh, what, in my opinion, one of the greatest individual sports that anyone could ever see in, in the world. And so, uh, athletically, you have some records and feats that, that I want to make sure James is around to hear. Uh, t- tell me about some of the records that you set and, and some of the ways that that you're able to focus yourself mentally to do that? Well, I've always considered, you know, and this we're talking going way back in 69 when I started putting everything together and formulating Neo uh, Pancration or the modern derivative of Pancration or Pagratian, the way the Greeks would pronounce it. And I just felt that, well, any athlete that is in a combat endeavor or discipline, whether it's boxing, wrestling, Muay Thai, um, ancient pancration that goes back 2,500 years, you have to be in great condition. And I was always an athlete. Uh, I aspired to be a great uh, basketball player, but it was a little too short. But I set records in basketball in my home state. I scored 68 points in one game. Um, wow. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and no boasting here, but I was just, I was a fanatic. I was obsessed with developing my body as well as my mind to be good at a sport. I wanted to make my father proud. And uh, that's the way it was in in Greek families. Um, So conditioning became very important. And, of course, I set records for my high school and track, um, both short distance and long distance. And that's why I'm still an avid runner and I've run 11 marathons. Um, it, 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 It was just something that I felt I had this incredible gift of energy and while i had this energy uh i wanted to you know just apply it in 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 the best ways that i possibly could so conditioning became very important and eventually i was able to set records for push-ups and you know i've seen jack lorraine on tv he was an idol of my excuse me i i saw him on tv doing these, these wild push-ups, fingertip push-ups, where his arms were extended way out in front of him and all of this. But he was using, like, five fingertips and then four fingertips and stuff like that. Now, this is back in the 60s. So I started, you know, doing my own form of push-ups, and I found they were relatively easy for me, especially my, my joints of my fingers. They seemed just incredibly strong. So I started out doing five fingertip push-ups and then progressed to four and then three and then two. And then I could do a one-arm push-up using two fingertips. And then with that, got too easy, and I could do dozens and scores of those. I started <laughs> messing around with thumb push-ups. And I was able to do thumb push-ups. I set two records for thumb push-ups. In fact, the first one was in 1977 in Boston. I, I did 45 in 51 seconds, and then I broke that three years later on national TV on the Guinness Book of World Records show. I did 61 in 47 seconds, and that's yeah. with my arms uh, pretty much slightly extended forward just on my thumbs. Well, well, I wanted to kind of like 
push the envelope a little bit. So, again, conditioning, very important. I was running, uh, I don't know, 14, 15 miles a day at the time and um, uh, working on core exercises, you know, back then. It How was many abs. miles did you run today? Uh, six. Holy shit. See yeah, that? because I kayaked That's all afternoon, so I, I had to take a break. Kayak. <laughs> Look at this, dude. See, you're, you're. This is what. See, anybody that ever tries to lay an excuse on me that's not disabled. Of course, I, I, I completely sympathize and forgive anyone who's been dealt a bad hand or been in an accident. But if you're just lazy and chilling, man, all of us can tap into this energy. You were lucky and blessed, and were raised in a way that you could develop it and nurture it and turn it into something exceptional. But I'm telling you what, James and I talk about this a lot off the air, but we can all tap into that energy. I have it myself in different ways. I use I use the, uh, my my brain uh, to do uh, things in the MMA world. Of course, I ring announce and I talk with my energy. But hearing you speak of that, that was such a great way to put it. And I just want people that are listening to understand that you can do anything you want. You just have to want to do it and be able to put in the commitment and the time to make it happen. Now, we're talking about this guy learning all kinds of the most important and lethal and uh, uh, defensive martial arts in the world and putting them together. However, before any of that, your body and your mind have to be ready for you to practice those things and learn how to get, get hit, learn how to not get hit after you feel what it's like to get hit and do it all yep. the time until you become so good at it that you can incorporate pieces of it into your style, which you call neopancreation. So let's fast forward back to that point. But before we do, I want to let James, if he gets a chance here, to ask any questions based on some of the dynamic things you've just uh, allowed us to hear. And, of course, like I said, it's not boasting. I asked, brother. So go ahead, James. Thanks, my well, friend. I have a couple of interests here. Um, I, I want to know a little bit more about the uh, the catch wrestling and, 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 and uh, just some of the things that you were shown and, and who they learned them from. Uh, you know, uh, I'm familiar with you know the Gotch and, and and the whole Farmer Burns and, and, the, and the whole uh, your catch wrestling catch as catch can. And uh, also, too, uh, have you competed in any uh, you know martial and kickboxing, professional boxing, uh, jujitsu tournaments? Have you, have you competed in anything? Well, you know, back in the day when I was in my 30s and I was competing, you know, my emphasis was on boxing and wrestling, and basically it was freestyle and Greco-Roman, you know, during my collegiate years. Um, I did compete in Muay Thai in Thailand. Um, My friend Supercat uh, brought me to his home, and his uncle had a stable of fighters, and... um, that's where I learned, you know, what the six-foot banana bag was about, you know, how to really use your elbows and knees, et cetera, and I got to compete. Although they weren't at that point in the 60s allowing Americans and very few uh, to compete at Lumpini Stadium. But, again, you know, I was, you know, they had these outdoor gyms, and outdoor bags and, uh, you know, training with these guys on, on the tie pads and the uh, uh, the body protectors uh, and the shin guards, et cetera, was like competing because these guys were were on top of you all the time and they were battering you with the, this equipment. And that kind of introduced me to, you know, something unique uh, that I had never seen before uh, because you were actually fighting these guys and the way your trainers got on top of you, especially, you know, if you were – uh, non-Thai, and you're American coming in there, I mean, they really wanted to teach you a thing or two about their brutal sport. And uh, <laughs> in a way, they're like that today. I mean, you know, they're getting a lot lot more uh, PR than they ever did. Now, you've got to remember, this is back in the 60s. I don't even think Black Belt Magazine, uh, which, which, you know, was started in 1961, I don't even think they had published an article in Muay Thai until 1970. So this was in the 60s. They didn't know anything about catch wrestling back then. When they did the cover story on me in 73 and I was talking catch wrestling, they really didn't want to talk catch wrestling. They wanted to hear about judo. They wanted to hear about karate. They wanted to hear anything that was Asian but not so much of Western influence, you know, because back then the whole push 
was toward the Asian culture. Because again, you know, you had your your Kempo, you had your 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 hundreds and hundreds of different styles of traditional martial arts, which which was great, you know, because I, I never you know, uh, condemn any style. I look for the strengths of all styles because there's okay. something valuable in that pool of total martial arts knowledge. And whether you compete with it or you use it on the street, well, you know, whatever you've got that will give you the edge, I mean, that that's great. And back then, stand-up fighters knew nothing about the ground, and ground fighters really weren't that skilled at striking. And that's where MMA comes in today. So... You know, I'm talking about doing this back in the 60s. So, it, uh, you know, again, pancreation taught me something. It taught me to open my mind, open my eyes to the values of all the different styles out there and not to think that this style or this person was superior to this one. Conditioning, uh, mind and body, is probably 60% of your success as a martial artist. But, you know... Um, you, you've got to be able to, to be disciplined, and you've got to be able to be open-minded enough to add to your arsenal. And the more techniques you add, you better be in great shape. Because if you go to the ground, well, you know, you better have great cardio. So, you know, that was key to me. And, and you know, people back then criticized me. They thought I was nuts, a passing oddity with long hair, all this stuff. Believe me, I've been called everything, and today I'm a pioneer. So, yeah, I just love doing it. It's like, you know, musicians with music. Uh, they love music. They, they're not so much into the, the hullabaloo of everything or, or the politics of it all, and, and I'm not either. I don't get into organizations. I don't, you know, go, you know, get into all of this other rigmarole and the red tape. I just, I love being fit, and I'm just consumed by martial arts, and I have been ever since I was seven years old. And I consider Western combat sports, wrestling and boxing, to be martial arts. I mean, wrestling is the oldest you. sport. Absolutely. Wrestling is the oldest sport. It goes back to ancient it's Greece. It's America's martial art. I mean, we're the melting pot no matter what. I mean, and I'll Absolutely. tell you what, you take it back to, to what we know about Native Americans, and they did all kinds of cool wrestling shit. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And I want to just talk yep. about how modest this guy is, James. He's won things like uh, Grandmaster of the Year, Living Legend, uh, Instructor of the Year, uh, International Man of the Year by World Councils. I mean, he's been called Athlete of the Century by his home state. I mean, come on, dude. This is one of the most elite martial artists that we will ever speak with, in my opinion. Yeah, Absolutely. And have you had the pleasure of uh, as an instructor? Uh, so you you've coached uh, guys in in different uh, events and things. Uh, yeah, I've, I mean I've been training guys since what seventy one, I think. I coined the term pancreation in nineteen sixty nine. So that to me is the year that I resurrected the ancient art, which had died out back in three ninety three A.D. And nobody was out there. Everybody was pushing the Asian martial arts or traditional martial arts, what have you, if people had forgotten about the values of wrestling and the values of boxing, et cetera. And I said, I came from that background, and I said, no, 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 a good wrestler, you know, will beat a, a guy that's just stand-up because the takedown and, and, and the clinch, you know, you have to be aware of all this stuff. And if you're not, then you're not understanding the totality of combat. And that's the, the root of pancreation or pancreation. That's the way the fighters fought. So for me, I had to kind of like reinvent the wheel and extract, you know, my previous studies along with what I had researched of pancreation, the art of my ancestors. And I just wanted the Greeks to get credit for what they had contributed to the pool of martial arts knowledge. Because for me, it was the missing link. People had forgotten that, hey, Western culture has, has a say in this. And so doesn't Western boxing and Western wrestling. So, you know, I, say I was a visionary, whatever. I just love the fact that MMA is so popular today because it confirms everything I envisioned 45 to 50 years ago. 
Now, who have you brought? Anybody that you've instructed in any of the various martial arts that, or however combinations that you teach under your own system? Uh, how many have had success in MMA, or is was it too early? Uh, because see, you were winning, you know, awards in 2009. I mean, there's plenty of MMA going on. Have you had the chance to bring up anybody and actually get them ready to compete in the cage? Because I know if anybody in the planet could come up with a game plan. And I'm talking from the beginning. When you get up in the morning, all the things you eat, the way that you get ready, everything you do to your body, your mind, and your soul, and all of the different ways that you can train your weapons to defend themselves and inflict damage, you could make a game plan that could be fucking impervious, my friend. Uh, I appreciate that, but I must tell you that Pardon. around 1990... <laughs> About 1991 or 92, I discontinued teaching publicly. This was right before the first NHB matches. And because I started focusing on teaching military, I was asked to teach the spec ops um, hand-to-hand combat for Operation Desert Storm. And I really got into that so much, and I enjoyed working with our military um, because of, of their great respect and their, their diligence and what they're doing for our country, that I really started focusing more on teaching them elements of what I would call um, more battlefield uh, concepts, as well as, you know, I had a lot of them that really wanted to know more about going to the ground and, and how to transition between the stand-up and the ground game. Whether, you know, and I never forced anybody to compete or go into MMA. If they have, that was on, of their own volition. But I really wasn't that type of instructor. I must also tell you that, um, yes, I was instructor of the year in 2009 um, for Black Belt Magazine. Uh, a great honor. Uh, I enjoy, you know, all the magazine articles and all the work I've done with them. Um, but, you know, the, the key was, I think, I got to a point where, I saw everything that was going on in MMA, and I felt that, you know, the the entire field was saturated with good coaches, good instructors, good fighters. And I said, well, if somebody, you know, wants to find me, they can find me. But, um, you know, I I right now am more into, believe it or not, I've been selfish all my life. I'm more into my own training. Um, I have to run a certain number of miles a day. I have to work out three or four hours. A day. I do train like an Olympic athlete, and and it, it's just this is my number one priority, especially as I get older, you know, because I'm still doing now in my 60s what I did in my 30s. So wow, and this is something that I I still do magazines. In fact, I've got. One, two, three big feature articles coming in, uh, coming out within the next three months, two of them with Black Belt Magazine, and it all emphasizes the importance of, of discipline and, and conditioning and believing in yourself and continuing this, not just during your fighting years, which probably, you know, is, I don't know, 35 maybe, and then you've got to start thinking about, you know, other things you want to do. Are you going to become a coach? Are you going to become a, a, a writer? Are you going to become um, a, um, um, a teacher Referee. of the military? You, you really have to have a backup plan. And that, to me, I was able um, uh, to be multidimensional where I was able to write. I've written seven books with, with uh, um, uh, one of my biggest books, 300 pages plus, coming out later this year. And and for me, this is the way I teach people. What's it I called? Very good plug it. Hey, give it a plug, plug before you move on, homie. Well, right now, the working title is, get this now, Combat, Conditioning, and Collective Wisdom, The Odyssey of Jim Arvanites. Yeah. So, it's part of the biography, gets into all the stuff we've been talking tonight about, but, but in more detail, more depth. But it's heavy, heavy into the biomechanics of combat motion and the conditioning that I've emphasized all these years. And I'm really proud of it. Everything really is coming together, you know, really coming together. Now, all my previous books, hey, I'm proud of too. But this one, boy, I'm putting a lot of work into it. 
Well, I'll tell you what, Jim. One of the things James and I talk about a lot uh, as being, you know, good friends, uh, not just co-hosting and being able to enjoy uh, the wisdom imparted from people like you, uh, but is, you know, he's getting ready to enter into a tournament. And these are the kind of things, man, this is your Yoda, bro. I mean, this is the kind of guy you need to hit him up after the show and start. I'm telling you, man, these are the kind of little extra things and, this is the kind of person who's been waiting for somebody. You've got to go to Dagobah, and you've got to seek this man out and, and find out what you can pluck from some of these, dude. I bet you you could resurrect much more than you even expect you can, my brother. That's on the love. Think- I'm, not trying to say, I'm not trying to act like I know a bunch of shit. I'm sorry. Please continue. <laughs> I think that, that you know, I, I, I've been kind of like selfish all these years, especially the past five or ten years, because – you know, again, MMA is a field that I'm very proud of, and I feel it, you know, has, has pretty much evolved from uh, what I was doing in the 60s, first, first doing in the 60s to the 70s and onward, but really what the ancient Greeks documented, fully documented, you know, as early as uh, the 12th millennium B.C. during the Jason and the Argonauts era. So MMA has really, really evolved, and I envision this. I knew that Pancration in some way would come full circle. And, um, I mean, the Greeks put out all of these great artistic drawings and uh, paintings and collages and uh, vases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, really, I mean, this culture was just incredible. I mean, let alone the Spartan history, you know, oh, yeah. but... but I am so deeply respectful of my ethnicity. And my father always told me, every morning before he went to work, be proud you're Greek. He says, because the the history of the Greeks, you know, especially our ancient forebears, uh, is etched in stone. And he was right. And and I've been uh, a... James has to bounce. I'm going to continue with you for about 15 minutes, but I want to let him uh, go ahead and say whatever he'd like to, to wrap up his part. Uh, go ahead, James. Sure. Yeah, Jim, yeah. I, I feel terrible, man. I'm, I'm, I'm dying. I, unfortunately, work calls me. I, I gotta uh, make an important call here, buddy. But I want to thank you. Huge fan of yours, man. Uh, respect and knowledge. Love the old school, man. And uh, I'd love to get the chance, the opportunity to talk with you again. That'd be awesome, man. And, and, and the best of luck to you in your upcoming uh, endeavors here. Absolutely, it's great talking to you, my friend. All right. All right, man, and again, uh, we're going to continue. So when you when you go into that, you know, being proud of yourself, one of the things that I was very lucky as a young person, you know, I was born the same year, I was born in 74. Um, my mother was 100% Polish on both sides, you know, just a couple of generations, uh, barely, you know, her grandparents came on the boats before Hitler started messing with them in Poland. And then my parents' side... <coughs> With with my grandfather and grandmother being first cousins, it was very easy to trace back lineage really far to the point where what was hilarious is I have the nickname The Butcher as a ring announcer, and I found out that one of my earliest ancestors gained that nickname during the War of the Roses for killing off the son of a land baron who he had killed to prevent, uh, you know, revenge, and he was ousted and sent to Ireland which led to our family coming over here in the 1500s. So it was really fun for me. My parents didn't, you know, obviously much like the Greeks, you know, because Greece was one of the first melting pots. It was one of the places where people of different descent and and that appeared different and that maybe worshipped differently were really able to enjoy commerce, social living, and culture yes. and so many different things contributed to it that's why i think when we take it to combat with wrestling and, and me being completely a philosopher and a person that loves to announce names loudly and get the entire crowd and people pumped up <laughs> and also now to learn about what got me to the position in a sport that feeds my family is that wrestling in america you know, the first, you know, modern melting pot, that so to speak, um, 
really is our martial art. I've preached it for years. I mean, in matter of fact, because I got the interview on like my second ever show. I remember hearing about a lot of uh, the early stuff, you know, and then it was very cool that you talked about different things than you talked about tonight. So I got to learn even more, but I always told people, I mean, when we were looking at the UFC at that point, and this is like five years ago or something, man, I think it might've been 2010 or 11. And almost all of the UFC champions were very, uh, they all started as wrestlers and sure. boxers, which yep. is, you know, boxing to me is more of, uh, something that kind of came over from the English Ireland, you know, the Island, uh, there, the, the great Britain area, you know, the, the boxing, the Donnie Brooks stuff, you know, that was kind of something right. that came through the immigration, but it became incorporated because much like you said, we were forced to see wrestling or boxing. However, as a, a I lived in a rural area where fights were cool because they were getting broken up and we're out in a cornfield party and, and people are forced to settle their differences. And they didn't have boxing gloves. We had headlights and ground. And they had whatever yeah. they were wearing. <laughs> and they went at it. And every single fight. Now, of course, I come from a wrestling school. So, of course, you know, everybody there is going to be at least familiar with it. But every single fight, you're exactly right. Anyone who thinks that a fight is going to stay uh, uh, on your feet is, is is watching too many movies or just hasn't seen it because – Every single fight, when someone got stuck on their back, they knew not what to do. Mm. And when I started seeing the NHB show up, you know, a friend of mine, of course, had the v, the infamous VHS tapes with Hoist Gracie oh, yeah. being, you know, 180 pounds and, you know, selling Gracie Jiu-Jitsu to the world by defeating hand-picked opponents. Um, you know, it, it created the idea it, it, pro, it propelled pro, propelled the idea that you sowed and that you were compelled yourself to just develop. And it's really cool to hear from a person who isn't grandiose. I mean, you're not running around going, yeah, I created everything. You did something for yourself. And I love the self-respect yeah, because it what, proves what your reality, sir. People... Please continue. What I tell people is I invented nothing. I created nothing. I simply assimilated. And and I put things together that would be effective if you were standing, if you went to the ground, and all of the transitions in between. You know, I, I had to be effective at all ranges because a real fight, you know, really goes through a lot of different cha transitions. There were changes going on from point A to point B constantly, and you have to be able to fluidly adapt. And, and be really, conditioned. It, That's number one. Well, I mean, yes, most people gas out from throwing well, three haymakers. I'll tell you, you know, boxing taught me a lot about having to be in great condition where you had to fight, you know, ten rounds. But it's wrestling. Even though you were in a shorter time period, the cardio and the, 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 all of the other stamina in the various um, muscles of your body are so Hardest tested sport in to wrestling. condition for in Absolutely. the world. And, uh, you and know, if you, if what, you makes put submissions sad, in it, what makes me sad... What makes me sad is our, our great sport of wrestling um, was eliminated from the Olympic uh, game schedule uh, for 2016. And again, it's already, to my knowledge, and this is, you know, from, from a good source, it won't be entered in the 2020 games. And so the tradition, the legacy of the ancient <laughs> Olympics has been lost. Because the Olympics has become a farce over my lifetime. Oh, it's a joke, yeah. And the IOC... The number one, the baddest man in the world became a woman. <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, what the fuck is that? And I have no problems with that. Live your life. Love what you do. Be yourself. Enjoy yourself. No problems there. But, damn, man, that shows you what the Olympics did. I mean, that was the last... The 70s and just barely into the 80s, except for some of the... You know, the problem is when you have champions winning 10 to 15 medals and they're not Jim Thorpe, and even Jim mm -hmm. Thorpe, 
was like a man among boys. You can tell that the competition is elsewhere because the money is not there anymore. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of money there, but they don't use it. They they pad their own pockets with it. And so, you know what? Without wrestling, uh, fuck the Olympics. They can they can yeah. definitely help themselves out. They could yeah. help themselves out by bringing it back, and I hope they do. I hope somebody makes that fucking shit happen. But if they don't, I don't even want to hear about them. But what I want to ask you now, uh, well, since we have some limited time, and we can go over. I want to talk to you as long as you want me to. So sure. I have a really cool question that I'd like to hear. Now, since you were one of the few people, um, but not the only one, who wanted to incorporate different styles of fighting so that not only could you protect yourself, but you could not only necessarily generate income, but create a way to show other people and, and you know, at the very least strengthen your neighborhood. When was the first time that you ran into someone who not only was well-versed in different styles of fighting, meaning, you know, ground, uh, submission, uh, and beating up people with different weapons. Um, and what did that meeting go like for you? Um, I, I mean, how enlightening and fun was that? Because, you know, I believe that, you know, obviously we're all connected to a consciousness grid. And if one person has an idea, even if they might be the first, there's going to be several hundreds of people strewn about randomly that pick up on that idea and go, hey, man, I want to fucking study boxing and wrestling and incorporate a way that me and my friends can compete where it's legal for us to use any weapon and see what happens. So when was the first time you ran into someone like that? What was their name and what did that meeting go like for you? Well, you know, back in the the, the heyday of karate and kung fu, um, really the, the only people that I ever met that were really kind of like multidimensional um, you know, was um, the Jeet Kune Do people in California when I was out there doing the Black Belt cover story in 73. Uh, Danny and Osanto was doing uh, weapons. Uh, um, you know, their, their groundwork was, was not, you know, really that strongly developed at that time. Um, but, uh, you know... Well, why would you if I you had a met... weapon, though, huh? Uh, huh? <laughs> Why would you What'd if you, you had a weapon? Well, I guess, yeah. I guess yeah. you wouldn't have much, you know, obviously. Sorry. <laughs> the other guy that, that I really felt really had his game together was a guy by the name of Masad Ayub. Uh, actually, Masad is the one that kind of like, if you will, in quotes, discovered me because, uh, you know, he, he was writing articles for Black Belt, and he looked me up because he heard all this you know, talk going on about me, and uh, sure enough, he found me, and um, we developed this rapport, and he was very, very um, skilled in a lot of different uh, weaponry arts. I mean, his his big forte, of course, is handguns, and he's he's nationally noted for that, uh, but he was also good with, with swords. He was also <laughs> good with knives. Um his hand-to-hand skills, well, he basically was learning from one of my students. But he was a very open-minded guy that really had this this um, ambition to learn all the different ranges and levels of combat. He wanted to know how to fight on the ground. He wanted to know what was – because he was an ex-cop. Uh, and, and he had gone to the ground a lot. And he told me, I, I just felt lost once I went to the ground. My confidence just went out the window. I uh, really because a lot of these these tussles with these guys on PCP will end up like on the ground. So he was another source. Um, you know, I heard about guys like like Gene LaBelle that you know when he fought Milo Savage, wrestling or judo against. Uh, well, actually, judo Gene also knew his stuff when it came to catch. So he's going to be a guest. On a side note, Jim. He's going to be a yeah. guest of ours coming up later this month uh, in February, as we've deemed this old school month, so that people can well, discover the Well, he's a good man, and uh, I, I'm sure he'll be a great that. guest. He's a but funny it's guy. Still, it's still style versus style, though. What, I, what I'm what i looking for is exactly what you're talking about. Um, you know, and one of the questions I'd like to kind of tack on to continue along with the first question is that when did judo become jujitsu and 
was there a lot of submission techniques taught in traditional judo, or was it all about punishing on the takedowns? Uh, when did the uh, limb control and chokes come into play? Um, do you know anything about uh, a, a form of judo, which is really a rules format known as kosen? I'm familiar with the term, but for our listeners, I'd really love to hear an explanation. We've we've got up to half an hour left uh, of extra time to use, so please continue. Well, I believe that Kosen Judo is really the precursor uh, to BJJ. Um, you know, I was really unfamiliar with BJJ until the, the late 80s, even before the 1993 events, but... Um, I had found through my research, because I'm always researching every fighting art out there, uh, I just had found that uh, uh, Kosen Judo was was the style that uh, was taught to Carlos Gracie by uh, Maeda. And Kosen Judo was was not your typical Olympic-style Judo that you see today, which is basically throws. Uh, There was a lot of emphasis on Niwaza techniques, which was basically ground techniques that featured you know, uh, pinning techniques or call, or mount techniques that you see in BJJ, there was a, a lot of overlap and a lot of good submission holes. There were Kimuras, of course. We know the, the history of Kimura and uh, uh, the, the events that Kimura um, actually had with uh, Elio Gracie, et cetera, uh, where we taught him that uh, Kimura arm lock. Um, you know, all of this stuff, all of this material really – we can go way back in um, uh, the Asian culture and find that jujitsu came first, and then of course Jigoro Kano developed, you know, a form of judo from that. And they were all style, all kinds of different branches of jujitsu. And but jujitsu back then wasn't so much ground oriented. It was it was stand up. There were a lot of submission holes, wrist locks, and strikes. You know, the Gracies are the ones that really took it a step further. But even before that, there was a lot of groundwork or Niwaza techniques in Kozen Judo. And this is what Maeda, of course, you know, um, uh, extended to the, to, the, to the Gracie family. So, and the Gracies, to my understanding, if, and please correct me if I'm wrong, what they did was kind of married uh, Muay Thai because you didn't see a lot of boxing stances coming from them. No, it was more upright, right? But, you know, i got to tell you, if anybody reads my books, if you really want to see some of the original stances that contributed to Muay Thai, uh, the, the ancient Greeks used a, a position like that where that lead leg was always ready to block a leg kick or use a teep, kick straight out to the, to the knee or to the lower gut, something called gastrizin. Lactisma is gastrizin, which was a gut kick. And a lot of the lower body techniques that are used in Muay Thai today, the ancient Pancratius used. They were realists. They took their fighting techniques and concepts from the battlefield, from an earlier form of, of Pagratian that was known as Palakan, which means total fight. And basically, their main kick was a front kick, and it was a very, very high stance where they were, their upper body was very erect and their hands extended out, their lead hand especially, and the back hand was chambered. And a lot of that lower mobility and the lower combat motion of the ancient Pancratius, very, very similar to Muay Thai and Muay Baran. Good stuff. Oh, and, and yes, when I saw uh, the Gracies... Uh, you know, using that, that type of position and kicking low at the knee, I said, whoa, there it is right there, Pangratian, Pancration, right there. You know, because basically that's the way they, they, their back was erect. You know, their, their lead hand was straight out to kind of like um, hold off rushes by the grappler, and they would use that, that leg, that front leg, to kick out just like a Muay Thai fighter. And, it, I mean, it was a direct kick either to the kneecap you know, which you've seen before. You saw that quite a bit in the early UFC events. And then, of course, also to the lower stomach. You know? And with John so. Jones and Leota Machida, the light heavyweight. There division. you go. 
was very effective with kicks. Uh, Jose, Al- Jose Aldo, you know, uh, reigned supreme uh, for several several years by uh, kicking people. Well, in you the never saw the you never saw a kick in ancient pancration between the years of 648 BC was when it was entered into the uh, um, you know the 33rd Olympiad to. Uh, 393 A.D., when all of the games were were outlawed and banned uh, by edict of the Christian Church. But basically in that time, all you saw was one basic kick. Now, it might have gone to the thigh, it might have gone, you know, to the ankle, but it was a straightforward kick because that's what ancient warriors used on the battlefield. If they were disarmed of their spears or their swords, they would use that straight kick from behind their shield. Okay, now let me ask you this uh, this huge important question that I have about what we're talking about right now. When we're okay. talking about uh, games and Tancreacion, uh when when you talk about the original, uh, these are obviously you know uh, contests that were being held. Um, were these being held to the death? Now, obviously, battlefield techniques. Uh, you know, in in modern times, the, the streets are the battlefield. You know, you never know what kind what kind of a person you could come into, what kind of person wants to fuck with you, or what kind of the wrong per you know, whatever scenario you'd like to come up with, uh, is male or female. Um you know, um back then, uh you're talking about, you know, when the Christian church outlawed something, obviously these guys weren't killing each other. Um what kind of a respect uh, and, you know, I have a hankering, you know, I'm thinking back, you know, because I love, uh, you know, modern ancient history, if you will. I like to go, you know, 20,000 years back and forward. Anything before that, man, this place has been scrubbed clean so many times. There's no sense speculating. I like to just human stuff. So when we fast forward to, to, to the Greek times where we actually started having a culture and spectators and, uh, you know, events, and things that people can do. Um, and, and in a way to satiate uh, a populace, you know, so that you might not necessarily have to go to battle, it's almost more about being prepared. So w- when we're talking about what you're talking about, you know, to your teep kicks, stances, uh, the wrestling techniques, the submission techniques, the, uh, you know, striking techniques, we're talking about competitions that were held in my coliseums, uh, in places where, you know, these guys were, were highly regarded. Uh, what kind of respect between athletes after two guys go in and, and give it their all to, to demonstrate the techniques that they've been working on uh, do, did we see back then? Well, I, I think, you know, like in my, my latest book, which I'll plug right now, Pencratia, hey, well the Ancient done. Combat Sport of Ancient Greece, MMA Origins, which came out last May 2015, I emphasize a section of the book that talks about uh, the attitude of fighters toward not only their trainers and their sport, uh, but also of their their own self-esteem and the respect that they showed to their fellow competitors. And as the sport evolved through the years, I think the the warrior attitude uh, or the, the ethos of, of combat was always ever-present because no matter what Greek combat sport or athletic activity you competed in in the Panhellenic festivals, your main objective was to win, to perform, because if you didn't perform, you were out, you know? So... You know, and the, the the primary officials that ran the Panhellenic Games and the Olympics, you know, made that decision. Well, they also looked at the way in which you treated your fellow combatant. And there was a high level of respect. Um, I don't think there has ever been any incidents that in all of my research where one Pancration athlete wanted to kill another. He wanted to win. He wanted victory in the eyes of the gods. But there was never that idea of death to one's opponent. Victory over one's opponent 
even if it meant death to yourself, because like you, you mentioned, there were some fatalities in the ancient Pencration, but but not as many as people think. You know, a lot of people think it was a fight to the death. It was not. It's an honorable it way not. to die for someone. It's an they, honorable way to die, and I'm sure they were treated yeah. as a hero and remembered and, and, and probably yeah. had things named after them. And so what I want to go here, I'm going to get I'm going to get real deep, and I'm going to say something because politically, and in in the times we live in, I think it's highly important to to involve uh, oneself in at least the observation and interpretation of modern politics. And Rome gets brought up a lot, and Rome is what fucked up Greece. Yeah, um, you know the Catholic the Catholic Church, the edict of the the, the weird little Christian thing that Constantine decided to to use to his advantage and control the populace and what uh, mistakenly or, you know, uh, coincidentally controlled the world, uh, in, in my opinion. Um, you know, when, when, when one talks about America and, and the problems we have, the problems we face in the future, the predictions, uh, we're, we're often compared to Rome. And one thing that Rome didn't have, you know, Rome, Rome got weird. You know, Rome did yeah. a bunch of messed up shit. Well, 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 Catholics do that. You know, certain types, certain types. I got, I got a lot of good friends that are Catholics that aren't uh, weird. Uh, they don't mess with children or want to watch lions eat anyone. But, you know, that's not an honorable fight. That's that's weird. Uh, that's blood sport shit. You know, that's not respectful. I mean, maybe there was some times where there could be respect given to someone. And, of course, Times are what they are, and history doesn't change itself. But I think one of the things that killed Rome is that they didn't have what Greece had, because Greece enjoyed a period of peace, so yes. much so that their culture is so strong, enchanting, mm -hmm. and, and, and in so many ways righteous, that it, it permeates all of the successful cultures today, including America. Now, one of the things I think that is really saving America, and I'm telling you, the streets are safer in this country after 93 in MMA. Yes. With what you witnessed come to fruition through, through if nothing else, uh, the consciousness grid and your influence on that by your interest in what is every champion's formula, which is mind, body, soul, competition. And you're able to do that. And and, and to me, uh, you know, I have such admiration and, and, and enjoyment out of that. And I, I just want to say to anyone out there that's worried, get yourself into a gym. Learn something. If nothing else, you don't even have to do that. Uh, take some walks. Then start running. Then start doing push-ups and sit-ups. I mean, I, I've been through points in my life where I was uh, persecuted by this uh, the state government for something that's now legal. Uh, you know, in, in the plant and stuff. And you know what I did? I did push-ups, sit-ups, and all kinds of stuff. You know, when you talk finger, fingertip sit-ups, uh, push-ups, I did the same thing uh, by osmosis somehow. It wasn't like my idea, but I was like, you know, I can put my feet up on this chair, and I can do fingertip push-ups, and I can develop different sets of muscles. So I can do like seven or eight different kinds of push-ups and actually have a total workout, you know, and then incorporate that with, different dips and sit-ups and things like that in, in a penitentiary setting. You know what I mean? And then sure. when you when you, when you you look at that, you know, to me, that's a society within a society because, you know, out here, I'm a majority. I'm, you know, a, a white male that walks the streets and in a country setting and there's never going to be any problems with, with anyone. And I was never taught that color even existed. You know, it was always just as different as, you know, that apple's red and that orange is, is is yellowish or orange or whatever. You know, it's just what it is. It doesn't mean that one's different. Of course, they're different from the other, and they both enjoy different characteristics that we can celebrate and even sometimes make fun of. But it doesn't mean that one's better than the other. They both nourish us. They both, you know, are part of what makes life enjoyable. So in, in my lifetime, I've noticed that, you know, when I was put in that situation, as a minority, I learned very much about about what life is like. I was I was lucky to to not have any horrible experiences in there, 
but I was also lucky to to experience it in 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 the fact that I wasn't a I wasn't a criminal. You know, I was a person who was. Uh, you know, using a, a much like you in MMA, and I'm not. Uh, you know, I'm I'm much. I'm atoned for everything I've done. And, and matter of fact, it, if I were to do the same thing today, it's it's completely legal in my state. Right. So I, much like you, it's like 20 years before all that happened. I was telling people, look, man, I don't want to take a bunch of pills. I don't need your uh, life changing. Uh, you know. Uh, well, back then it was like uh, Prozac and things like that. So if you were a little different than everyone else, they might tell you that you might need something like that. And at that point in time, I would stop talking to someone who I sought help from. Who I was like, hey, man, I'm trying to figure out how to be a good human, so I'm going to tell you about myself and see if I can fix it. They want to give you prescriptions. So I left. And then when I uh, you know, encountered what I got in trouble for, I I was always telling people, look, man, I'm not doing this because uh, I'm partying or I'm out in some setting where I'm trying to to find girls or change someone else. I'm doing this because, you know, to me, this is naturally grown stuff. This is something that isn't turned into and mixed with a bunch of other chemicals and used to change your brain. This is something that alleviates stress. And so, to me, when I got forced into that setting for a reason that wasn't, uh, you know, something that someone normally deserves to go uh, to that area for, I I can just relate to a lot of things in life now by seeing that, look, out of 3 to 5% uh, of white people who were incarcerated where I was, you know, uh, 70% of them were people that were militant against, like, the other 90% who were, were black people. And I'm like, hey, man, I don't want nothing to do with you guys. I have nothing against them. You're crazy to inflict that pain upon yourself. You know, in, in life now, I apply that to situations and, and win, you know. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I'm it's sorry. the attitude. <laughs> you know, you have to have an attitude where, you know, we're all all trying to project who we are inside, you know, and, and sometimes we take, what we feel is the right path and you know sometimes according to someone else it's not i i mean we've all been down that road you know i'm not proud of some of the you know the the fights i was in when i was younger and and you know the 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 lack of remorse i had for an opponent i left on the street you know you 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 mature a little bit and you look back at some of these things and you say you know hotty tie you beat your chest and all of that but in time you really become so wrapped up in your passion for what you do, your passion for life. That That's where fitness has, has kind of been my saving grace because, uh, you know, this is what I, I, I push myself to do every day. It's like eating. It's like waking up and brushing your teeth. It's a habit. And, and it, A, it's kept me out of trouble <laughs> these years. It's kept me very active, but it's kept me passionate about life. And I think that's important. If you're passionate about life, you can discover yourself and some capabilities that you would have never known you had, you know, if you didn't have this this kind of devotion. For that to change the world again. I mean, just think how advanced we were at one point in time, except for a certain ideology and a group of people who developed... Uh, weapons of mass destruction and armies who were committed to the false principles uh, have inflicted punishment upon uh, generation after generation. And now look at us. We're breaking free from it because of people like you. I mean, I have no doubt in my mind that you picked up on or helped create a, a group consciousness that has not just swept the world, but is it, it, it's beginning. I mean, it, we're at the, we're at the, the origins of it. I mean, you're you're able. I mean, I guess one of your goals must be to stay as fit as you can. Not only because it's the right thing to do and it's something that you've developed as as, as a habit, but because you want to be around to see what this turns out to be. Because I think we, we have saved the world by doing this. Not me myself, yeah. but it collectively. I really believe that, and and I I just feel like saying that. I mean, that's honestly what, what I've gained from this conversation today. Excellent. Excellent. Well, and on that I've note, always... I, want, I want to thank you for coming out and give you a chance to plug 
each and every book and talk about anything you may have coming up appearance-wise. I want to thank every victory earned, uh, our clothing company sponsor, longtime friend, Anthony, and also Nutsack Foods. Uh, Look them up and order those online. It's just one of the coolest little things that I've ever found. And honestly, it's a high-quality mixed nuts, cashews, all the different kinds of shit you want. And, of course, ACSLive.tv. So, so Jim Arvanitas, uh, closing thoughts and, of course, you know, shout-outs and plugs, please. Well, I'd, first of all, I'd like to say hello to Rosie, <laughs> my ex-neighbor. Uh, uh, she wanted me to throw that in there. Um, awesome. You know, and uh, basically, you know, any of my books, videos, instructional media, et cetera, it can be found on Amazon.com. And signed books can be purchased through my website at jimarvanitas.com. I have an article, a feature article in Taekwondo Times this month, written by one of my previous students and one of my best friends, Porter Dodge. So a shout out to him. Uh, And a couple of feature articles coming out in Black Belt Magazine, whose editor is... uh, um, a true warrior in spirit, uh, Robert Young. So um, that's it. Probably do a couple of, uh, you know, videos. I, I keep getting requests for doing more videos, and so I'm really looking into doing, you know, maybe a couple more this year to come out in tandem with the book. And that's outstanding. I mean, that's that's a way of teaching without – forcing people, you know, in a society where a lot of us can't really go too far from home. I mean, we have families. We have to protect right. our families. We we don't want to drop them off or be away from them. I mean, this is a way for people to learn uh, how, how to stay fit, how to improve your lifestyle, how to be around for those memories. Uh, and also, yeah, absolutely. And, and our, technology, our, our technology can encourage that today. So take advantage absolutely. of it. That's, that is just so great. And I want to wish you all the best. Uh, I look forward to catching up with you again. I want to say a big shout out and thank you to Jeff Wagner, close personal friend of mine who has helped us out this month. Uh, he reached out to you to get us our, our first week of guests. I'm so glad we started at the beginning. I mean, it was really yeah, fun. Yeah, Jeff's and a good man. Take our previous guest as well, um, Dean Lister. And that was a great conversation. Uh, so, Thank you, and thank you to all of our ear holes, our beloved listeners. Look for the T-shirts coming out soon. This is Dave the Butcher Clifford signing off for myself and James Lee and Uncensored MMA Online Radio. I'm hoping that this thing loads so I can play my Hogan's Heroes song. Eh, it won't let me do it. And so I really appreciate you coming on. You have a great night, and I hope that everything goes well for you. Thanks for having me on, Dave. Always great to talk to you. You bet. Awesome. Take care. Bye-bye. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.